Good evening. Welcome to this virtual worship service at Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church, Torrance, California. It is Thursday, April 1st, 2020, 2021. It is also Monday, Thursday evening. And so we begin the special services that we have at the end of our Holy Week celebration. This evening, in particular on Monday, Thursday, we focus our attention on the wonderful feast and meal that our Lord gave to us for the forgiveness of our sins called the Lord's Supper or Holy Communion. As we worship this evening, our focus will be on that place of the Passion, the place of a feast, which is the Last Supper. May God bless us tonight as we focus on that and we also think what that means to us that the Lord left us with this wonderful meal to assure us of our salvation. We'll use the order of service that's in your worship folder. If you are a guest who's joined us through the link on our website, there's another link there that you can click to get our worship folder so that you can follow along. The service will be a little bit different than we've been doing on Sunday mornings this evening, and we will have a few more responsive sections, so you might want to have that worship folder handy. Let us begin our worship then on this Monday, Thursday evening with our opening hymn number 136. "Twas on that dark, that doleful night. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, 
and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of His Spirit to amend our life, lives continue with us because of His love for us in Jesus, our Savior. With and through the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life. In the absolution spoken to us, we receive forgiveness from God Himself. Let us not doubt this absolution, but rather firmly believe that thereby our sins are forgiven before God in heaven, for it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord. We who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to one another as Jesus became our servant. It is, however, in Holy Communion that the members of Christ's body participate most intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's Last Supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of his meal. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood and participate in that new covenant that makes us one in him. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the culmination of our reconciliation with God and one another. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart. I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. In what I have done and left undone, I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this, I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg your mercy, O Lord. Forgive us, Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Cleanse me from my sins. Release me from my guilt. Grant me your Holy Spirit so that I can amend my sinful life. Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, he forgives us our sins, and through this gospel calls us from darkness to his marvelous light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on a cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We have two lessons on this Monday, Thursday evening. The first lesson is recorded in the book of Exodus, chapter 12, verses 1 to 14. The events of Lord Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper took place on the night that they were celebrating the Passover festival. And here we have a description of that Passover festival when it was first instituted by God, reminding us that all of these things were shadows and that Jesus finally is the fulfillment of everything that took place in that Passover festival. We listen to it as it was first instituted. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. 
Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roast it over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some, of it, some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. Here ends our first lesson from God's Word. Our second lesson for us is recorded in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, his first letter, chapter 10, verses 16 and 17. The Apostle Paul here reminds us of the importance of the Last Supper, the Holy Communion for us today. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Here ends our second lesson from God's Word. We'll join now in singing our hymn of the day, number 123, verses 1 to 3, Lord Jesus Christ, you set us free.
Dear friends in Christ, the word of God that we're going to meditate on tonight are the words that are recorded in the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 14, verses 12 through 26. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, when it was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, telling them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he enters, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus said, had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table, eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They were saddened, and one by one they said, Surely, you don't mean me. It is one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. This is the word of our God. Did you know that the place of the Last Supper was kept hidden? Jesus was probably in Bethany at the time. And we're told that he sent two of his disciples, Luke tells us it was Peter and John, to prepare the Passover for them in Jerusalem. But Jesus didn't give them an address to go to. He didn't give them a specific location where they would do that. He told them to go into Jerusalem and a man carrying a jar of water would meet him and they were to follow him until he came to a house and that was the place that they were to prepare for the Passover. So no one there with Jesus knew where the place was except for Jesus. Why such secrecy? Well, one possibility suggests itself so that Judas wouldn't know where it was. The arrest of Jesus was not going to take place in Jerusalem. Jesus had things he yet needed to do. And he wanted to do them undisturbed. But Jesus, before he did them, wanted to complete them. And then when he was ready, he would say to Judas, what you have to do, do quickly. But first, Jesus wanted to celebrate a feast with his disciples. A feast that had three communions as part of it. Communions that were intended to nourish the souls of his disciples and sustain them in the future. The first of those communions is a communion between the bread and wine and Jesus' body and blood. And when you sit down for a meal, how do you know what you're going to eat? Well, you, you look, right? Chicken is chicken. Potatoes is potatoes. Beans is beans. But if you want to know what you're eating that isn't apparent to the eyes, then you have to read the label to find out what's actually in the food. For example, here's some salad dressing. And on the label, it says 
It's made up of organic soybean oil, organic cane sugar, organic distilled vinegar, organic egg yolk, organic buttermilk blend, organic non-felt milk, salt, garlic powder, lactate acid, organic onion powder, and on and on. Well, there's a lot of stuff in this food that you can't see. Well, what did the disciples see as Jesus prepared the feast before them? Well, the scripture tells us, doesn't it? It says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them. So what did they see on the table? They saw bread, and bread is bread. They saw wine, and wine is wine. But there was more on that table. There was more that Jesus was giving them, but they couldn't see it. The only way to know what was really there was to read the label. In other words, to listen carefully to what Jesus said. And here's what scripture says. He took the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup and offered it to them saying, this is my body blood. With and under that bread and wine, Jesus is giving to his disciples his own body and blood. That very body that was nailed to the cross, that very blood that coursed through the veins of our Savior. This is an unbelievable, miraculous thing that is happening here in this feast. But how can that be? How can that be that when we eat that bread and that wine, which we can see, we are at the same time really and truly receiving the body and the blood of our Savior Jesus? One famous professor once said, if a hundred thousand devils should rush forward and ask that question, we know that all the demons together with all the scholars of the world do not have as much wisdom as God does in his little finger. In other words, Jesus' words simply stand. We don't need to know the how. What we need to know is what Jesus said. And Jesus said, this is my body. This is my blood. The second thing that takes place, the communion that takes place in this feast is a communion between God and sinners. When you have a meal, who do you usually eat with? Isn't it your friends? When we have a progressive dinner here at Zion, we like to eat together because we are friends with one another. We care about one another. If you go to a wedding banquet and you look for a table, who do you usually sit with? Why, you sit with your friends, right? In fact, it's often difficult to get people to sit on a table where they don't know the people. It's very uncomfortable if we don't know the people, even worse if we don't care for those people, and even worse than that if we hate those people. Well, isn't it interesting with whom Jesus feasts in this upper room? First of all, he feasts with his betrayer, and he knows it. The scripture tells us, I tell you the truth. One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. This was prophesied already in Psalm 49 years before this, that the betrayer would be one of Jesus' friends, someone who ate meals with Jesus. And yet Jesus is not afraid to eat with his betrayer. Indeed, Jesus loves his betrayer. He loves him and he wants to make him his friend again. He first of all points out to him and exposes him that he knows who he is. But then in love, he warns him and he says, Woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. But when you stop and think about it, actually all of the disciples who were eating that feast with Jesus were his enemies, weren't they? They were sinners. That means they, they refused to bend their will to his. They were all deserters 
and deniers. They thought more of themselves and more about protecting their own skins and their own reputations than about defending Jesus and standing up for him. They were all betrayers. They all uh, denied Jesus, turned their back on Jesus in order for themselves to gain something at some time in their life. They all turned their back on Jesus for their own pleasure. And yet, here we see Jesus eating with them. Not only eating with them, but connecting himself to them by giving them his very body and blood in this feast. How could he do that? How could Jesus join himself to sinners? Well, the answer is in that very feast and what it, its purpose was. Because in this feast, Jesus was making a covenant with his disciples. And that covenant was a covenant of forgiveness, a covenant of the cancellation of sin. Sometimes we make covenants, but they're usually two-sided covenants. They go something like this. You don't punch me, and I won't punch you, okay? But when Jesus makes this covenant, it's a one-sided covenant. It's simply a promise of his forgiveness. He is giving them a blessing, making them friends again of his through the forgiveness of of their sins. And so it is for all of those who come to this special meal, which we call the Lord's Supper. Because we are all sinners. We are all enemies. We are all betrayers and deniers and deserters of Jesus. And yet Jesus invites us to come, sinners though we are, with all our load of guilt on our shoulders. He invites us to come. And then he comes to each one of us personally, individually, and says, here, your sins are forgiven. This is my body and blood which I used, I paid for the debt of sin that you owed, that I gave as a ransom to free you from hell. And in that eating and in that drinking, we are in communion with him. We share this meal with him. We're no longer enemies, but we are friends. And that special feast that Jesus had with his disciples also points forward to a, an even more special feast. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. And that echoes something that Jesus had said earlier in his ministry, which is recorded by Matthew. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Those who eat and drink the body and blood of Jesus for forgiveness in faith will also one day eat and drink in that heavenly fest feast with Jesus in heaven. And that's a, a, just a wonderful picture of the blessings of the united Christian church joined to Jesus in heaven for eternity. And the same love and concern for all of those that were here eating this feast with Jesus in that upper room is the same love and concern Jesus wants us to have for all of those with whom we eat this feast. As we eat this feast with them, we, we have a special unity and a special union with them, with Jesus and with one another, a bond of forgiveness and love. The Lord's Supper is called Holy Communion with good reason because there are three communions that take place in this Lord's Supper. One is the union between the bread and wine and Jesus' body and blood. One is the union between Jesus and sinners. And one is the union between people and people who take this feast together. But they all have something in common. And that is that they all exist because Jesus sacrificed his body and blood on the cross. 
And so they are all centered on the most important thing in this sacrament. That is, the forgiveness of sins. So dear friends, as you have opportunity, come, take and eat this marvelous feast of our Savior and leave satisfied with his peace. Amen. Rejoicing in the blessings that Jesus gives through this body and blood that he has given to us in the Lord's Supper, let us give thanks to our Lord. First of all, our monetary thanks through the offering opportunities that we have as listed in our worship folder. And then let us also give thanks with our prayers, as we will do now through the prayer that's printed in your worship folder that we'll read responsively, as well as our Lord's Prayer and the prayer that follows that. Let us now bring our prayers before the Lord. Lord God, Heavenly Father, author of the everlasting covenant and giver of the cup of salvation, we gather in your courts to offer you our sacrifice of thanksgiving for fulfilling your promise to establish a new covenant through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We give you humble and hearty thanks. As our Lord Jesus Christ gave thanks to you when he broke the bread, as he gave thanks to you when he took the cup, we also give you thanks. Precious Savior, both priest and offering, awe and wonder fill our hearts when we partake of your body, broken for us, and your blood shed for us. We praise you, bless you, and adore you, Lord Jesus Christ. In our poverty of righteousness, we have nothing to offer. Without your tremendous sacrifice, we would still be in our sins. But through your sacrament of the New Testament, we are assured that our iniquities are forgiven and our sins are no longer remembered. O Holy Spirit, dwell within us as we remember our Lord's death in this sacrament. Enter our hearts to strengthen our faith and fill us with gratitude for your great mercy. Move us to encourage one another to love and to do good works. As our Lord served his disciples by washing their feet, so may we also humbly serve one another. Help us live our lives as sacrifices of thanksgiving to him who first loved us. Amen. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the ages to come, life everlasting. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our Monday Thursday service concludes with the singing of our last hymn, number 595, before the ending of the day.
We are glad that you were able to join us for this Monday, Thursday evening service. And we remind you that we have another service tomorrow, Good Friday service, which we will look at the place of the passion will be the cross, a place of death. And though it sounds bad, it is also the greatest joy for us because of what that death means. So please join us for that virtual service tomorrow. And then on Easter Sunday, we will again have an, a virtual service available for you online. But we will also have our Easter service outside in our field at 9 a.m. We will be wearing masks and doing distancing so that we can have that service. We invite you to join us if you are able. May the Lord keep you as we continue to contemplate these important things our God has done for us in this Lent ending season.